Welcome to worship at First Lutheran. We are glad you are here with us today. A couple of announcements. One is that we are now into the season of Lent, and we are uh, having Lenten services on Wednesday evening at 6.30 inside the, the sanctuary, and those services will be live-streamed, uh, so you can find those on the website at threecross.org or on Facebook Live. Uh, we will also be um, broadcasting uh, to the parking lot on uh, 96.3 FM. So if you choose to worship in the parking lot, you may do that also. Again, we are glad to have you here, um, and we will begin our, begin our worship with Give Me Jesus. Lord, we enter into this time of confession and forgiveness to give over to you all the things that weigh us down, that come between us and our neighbors, that come between us and you, in order that you would give us Jesus. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. Yet we trust in our own works rather than in God's grace. Jesus calls each of us to take up our cross. Yet rather than allow our selfishness and sin to be put to death, we cling to what we know. Jesus calls us to follow him. Yet we fear where faith will lead and what it might change in our lives. In this moment of silence, we confess the sin that separates us from one another and from God. People of God, hear this good news. God's covenant with us is true, and God is faithful even when we fail. Through the Holy Spirit, God gives us the gift of faith and makes us righteous. Believe in the good news that you are set free to live as children of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading for today is from Matthew, the 16th chapter, uh, beginning with verse 20. He, Jesus, sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, 
If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. So today in the Lord's Prayer, uh, as we're continuing to move through it, we are on the petitions that speak to temptation and evil. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And as I think about that line, temptation, what hits me most often is the idea of the Ten Commandments, especially those last seven commandments where we are told not to do certain things. You know, we're to, well, honor our mother and father. We're not to kill and steal, commit adultery, lie, and covet. And really that coveting, that idea of uh, getting something that we don't have, really kind of leads us into those other commandments. But all of them Um, really end up with the idea of us wanting to be in control. If you take a look at um, lying, for example, bearing false witness, what we're trying to do there is either raise ourselves up to make us look better or tear somebody else down. If we are a little short on cash and we need some money, it might lead to stealing to make ourselves uh, better off, to put ourselves in a better control put ourselves above somebody else. And each of the commandments we can go through and see how we want to be in control and that desire to be in control leads us uh, to be uh, tempted to sin. But the interesting part is that these temptations are really what Luther called kind of the, the little temptations. The big temptations are really the the two that that we would tend to look at as being not that important. Uh, The temptation of false belief and the temptation of despair. Seems a little bit odd to be talking about those two. But we will dig into that a little bit, uh, dig into it deeper uh, as we move into uh, the, the sermon today. The idea, um, I think, presents itself fairly clearly as we look at Jesus and the disciples and Jesus' movement uh, into into the crucifixion and, and after. So our text for today is Jesus talking to his disciples, telling them that he's going to go to Jerusalem and uh, be, be put on trial and then be killed and on the third day rise again. In this time frame, uh, Jesus gives them that warning several times, and in this time frame of his warnings, the disciples are arguing about um, interesting things. What they're arguing about is, who's the greatest? Which one's going to get to sit on his right hand? Which one's going to sit on his left hand? In a sense, who's going to have the most power? Who's going to have the most benefit? They're looking at themselves and their idea of uh, the kingdom, their idea of glory and power. They're not focused on God's will or God's kingdom, but they're focused on themselves. In that reading from today also, we get that idea as Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself take up his cross, and follow me, to deny ourselves. You see, so often we are at odds with what God's plan and God's will is for us in our lives. So, we've got that story where Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to go die. Peter then, um, seeing that that's really not what he would like to see happen and not what would help you know, put them in power if your leader ends up getting killed. 
So Peter takes Jesus aside and says, oh, no, Jesus, that can't happen to the Messiah. No, that's, that's not good. And then Jesus says, no, Peter, you're thinking about what you want, not what God wants. As time moves forward, the disciples are at the Last Supper. They are sharing that meal together, the Passover meal together. And Jesus is with the disciples there. The two disciples that we're going to focus on in this message uh, gives us kind of a compare and contrast of what happens with those ideas of false belief and where despair can lead us. So at the Last Supper, um, they, are, they are there gathered together. Judas takes a piece of bread and eats it and ends up leaving. And it's right after that that Jesus makes a, a pronouncement. Basically, he gives them, uh, the disciples, a promise. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. Believe in God and believe in me. You see, Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that it's going to be a time that is ripe for false belief and a time ripe for despair. So let's take a look at those two disciples, and we're going to start with Judas. Now, I'm going to speculate a little bit on Judas here. One of the things that we do know about Judas was that he was uh, a member or part of a group called the Zealots. And the Zealots were really interested in starting a revolution so that Rome could be kicked out of their country, that they could be back to being a sovereign state. And Judas was certainly in favor of that. The other thing that's interesting about Judas was that he was skimming money out of the purse. He was the one who kept the money for Jesus and the disciples. And when money came in, he would take his cut, um, take, <laughs> take what he wanted, I guess. Now, if this revolution were to start, this uh, time of great change, this time of Jesus becoming the leader, I think there might be a little bit more cash in the treasury to be skimming. Instead of being out helping poor people, helping sinners, helping those who needed to be healed, they could be doing some real things. And I think Judas was ready for that to happen. And at that Last Supper, Judas takes off. Before those words of promise, before those words to say, do not let your hearts be troubled. In a sense, keep your faith. Before those are spoken, Judas leaves. And he goes and gets his 30 pieces of silver from the, from the chief priests, turning Jesus over. In a few short hours, Jesus and the other disciples will be in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus will be arrested. He'll be taken to the high priests. He'll be uh, put on trial by the, chief, the high priest and by Pilate, and he'll be sentenced to death. It is at that point where Judas goes and gives the money back in an attempt to change what he's done. See, my guess is that Judas was trying to push Jesus into a corner so he would have to start that revolution. So he would have to bring his followers and begin this revolution. But at this point, Jesus is condemned to die. Jesus is not fighting back. Jesus is not calling in people into battle, into revolution. And Judas sees his plan his ideas falling apart. The chief priests tell him, I don't care if, they, if Jesus is innocent. What you've done is you've done, and you've turned him over to us. It's no longer your business. For Judas, he has now fallen into despair. His false belief in his plan and in his hope for a revolution falling apart. And he is failing to hear and to see and to understand the promises 
that God has for him. That promise of being with him. That promise of the forgiveness of sins. That promise of grace. And that promise that Jesus delivered uh, in the, at the Last Supper where he says there's a heavenly place for you. And that promise of everlasting life. Judas loses hope in his storm. In the trial of his life, Judas loses hope. And he doesn't make it to the resurrection. He doesn't make it to that Easter morning to see and to hear about the empty tomb. Judas fell prey to the temptation of despair. Now let's look at Peter. Peter was um, there at that Last Supper also. Peter heard the promise that Jesus spoke of that promise of, or that command, really, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. A few short hours after that, Jesus and the disciples go to the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus tells the disciples, he says, look, you guys are all going to fall away. You're all going to, in some form or another, flee from me or deny me. And Peter, wanting to be in control, wanting to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to have his plan work, says, Lord, no, even if everybody else falls away, I won't. I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, well, Peter, tonight, tonight, this very night, you're going to deny even knowing me three times. And Peter vehemently says, oh, no, Jesus, even if I must die with you, I'll never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. A little bit later, the crowd comes in with Judas, and Jesus is arrested. He's taken to the high priest's house. Peter's in that courtyard warming himself by the fire, and that servant girl comes up. And she looks at him and says, hey, you were with that Jesus guy. And Peter's like, no, no, no. Denies it. Wasn't me. I, well, I wasn't part of it. I don't even understand what you're talking about. And then the rooster crows. And then she comes up to him again and says, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure you were with that Jesus. No, no. Peter denies it again. And then the crowd comes, or people who are standing around, they say, certainly you were with Jesus because you're a Galilean. And Peter calls down curses from heaven and swears that he does not know this Jesus guy. And the rooster crows a third time, or a second time, and Peter breaks down and weeps. Peter is entering into that place of despair. His false belief that he was strong enough to deny, to always stand up for Jesus. His false belief that uh, he was able, that his plan would work, is beginning to fall apart. Peter is entering into a phase where despair is tempting him. The interesting thing is from here on out, we don't hear anything of Peter in the Gospels until the women come to the disciples Sunday morning. Once the stone is rolled away from the tomb, Peter then hears that news, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus has risen. Peter was hanging out with the other disciples. Did the other disciples help him? Remind him of the promises? Were they there to support him in that storm that he was having? Maybe. But Peter, even through his despair, gets to hear the words that Jesus forgives him. Peter goes on to be one of the, the rocks of the church, the foundations of the church. And he makes a big difference in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Big difference between the two and the promises that they heard and the promises that they trusted in. 
Peter made it through the storm. Today, many of you may be in a storm or a dark valley in your life. Many of you may be feeling like your plans and your dreams aren't turning out the way that you had hoped that they would. That may be leading you to some despair in your life where it's hard to see and to be hard to see and to believe in the promises that God has for you. That promise that God is with you wherever you go. In the fourth verse of Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or the darkest valley, I am with you. God promises that he is with us in whatever is going on. God promises that we are worth so much to him that he would send Jesus to the cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have that grace knowing that when we focus on ourselves and we focus on what builds us up rather than what God may want us to do, that we have forgiveness, that we have that grace, that we have hope in that storm. And we have that hope of the resurrection of life or the resurrection from the dead, that there is life after death. God has given us those promises. So today I invite you, no matter where you're at, in your despair, in your false beliefs, that you would cling to those promises, that you would hold fast to those promises in the storm. Hold fast to those promises of God and God's love and God's grace for you. Amen. In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of the wall You guard my soul You When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. And I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family. I can feel the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm.
Let us join together in confessing our faith according to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we join together in prayer for the sake of our congregation, our community that we're called together to serve, and all of God's creation. And again, after each petition, we'll be singing the refrain of, Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, in all times in our life, we're faced with a variety of temptations. And you don't pull us out of those temptations, but we ask that you would grant us the faith to hold fast to your word. Give us ears to hear your preaching. Give us congregations of fellow believers to turn us towards you, that you would keep us from falling into despair, that you would keep us from trusting in ourselves to work out our salvation, but instead to look to you alone for all that we need for this life and the one to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, today we pray for the family of Jack Hardy as they mourn his passing. We also pray for Brian and Nancy Heathus and family as they mourn the loss of Brian's brother, Jeff. Lord, keep them from falling into despair. Help them to hold on to the promise of life to come that comes through Jesus' death and resurrection and our being bound to him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Jesus Christ, our great physician, we ask for healing for Naomi Adams, for Jim Valen, for Susie Barnes, for Connie Love, and any others we name, either silently or aloud at this time. Lord, again, grant them faith. May your Holy Spirit go to work in them that they would not despair, that they would not look to the wrong places for hope, but that they would find hope in you alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, today we give thanks as we welcome into your family Brooks Crew Thompson, who was baptized on Saturday, February 20th here at First Lutheran. We give you thanks for that gift, that promise in baptism that overcomes our despair and our false belief, the promise that we're bound to you now and always, that wherever you are, there too we shall be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of marriage, an example that's lifted up in your word that is pointed to as what that relationship between 
you, Jesus, and your church can look like, a place, uh, uh, a relationship that operates continually on grace. Lord, today we give thanks for uh, 50 years of marriage for Dave and Cindy Halsrud. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Jesus Christ, remember us in your kingdom and continue to fashion us after your image. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Called and sent by Jesus Christ, we the people of First Lutheran are gathering to know Jesus, serving to make a difference. Yeah.